Hey everyone, I hope you had a great Mother's Day and uh, we're looking forward to a great week together. I hope your Monday's getting off to a, uh, to a good start at least and uh, looking forward to a new week. Well, this is uh, lesson three of our Bonhoeffer Life Together study. I hope you've enjoyed the first uh, couple of lessons together. Now, today, specifically in this lesson, we're going to be talking about what Bonhoeffer calls the day alone, the day alone. It's about the discipline of what's called solitude or and silence, the discipline of silence and or solitude. Um, what exactly is he talking about when we, when we discuss this discipline? Well, it, it's not talking about uh, escapism. You know, sometimes we as believers can be tempted by something called escapism. And that means we just say, I've, I've had it with the church. I've had it with uh, religion, organized religion, the institution of the church, that sort of thing. And so we just bail on that. We bail on everybody. And we uh, try to live this um, what's called ascetic or mystic life. We, we just sort of try to get away from it all. That's escapism. Now, when we talk about silence or solitude, uh, escapism is not what we are talking about. Lone Ranger Christianity will just never do. It's never going to work. People have tried it many, many times, but it just doesn't work. In fact, I had a pastor friend the other day. He was talking to me about uh, uh, certain people who have uh, taken that escapist route and uh, have gone the uh, Lone Ranger Christian way. And uh, he said one particular guy uh, told him that he had given up on organized religion. And my pastor friend told him, well, you can come to our church because uh, there's nothing organized about us anyway. So I thought that was a good, uh, that was a good response. We're, we're not organized religion. <laughs> we're, we're just broken people trying to follow uh, Jesus Christ and listen to the Spirit. So uh, this is not some sort of uh, Lone Ranger Christianity type of thing. When we say solitude or silence, that is uh, not what we're talking about. So what are we talking about? What does the Bible have to say to us in terms of how we spend our time alone? How do we uh, do well at spending time with ourselves, um, but also being sensitive to the church community. Well, solitude and silence is basically this. Um, it's not the escapist route. In biblical terms, it is waiting for the word of God to, uh, to impress you, to indwell you. That's what Bonhoeffer says. Solitude and silence, it's not escapism. It's not some mystical thing. Um, it is waiting patiently waiting for God's word. And how do we know that exactly? Well, we look at the example of Jesus. How did Jesus both take time to interact with the crowds, but also how was he at uh, being effective with solitude and silence? Well, you'll notice in the scriptures, especially in the gospel, that uh, gospels, that Jesus got away to pray um, a lot, right? Jesus um, got a way to pray, got a way to uh, concentrate, meditate on the scriptures, and hear from God. Uh, and sometimes uh, we have to do this. We have to do the same. If it, this was important for Jesus to get away from crowds and even from the disciples and the apostles, then obviously it's going to be important for us. Also, however, it is, um, it's good to realize that Jesus had what is called a ministry of interruptions. Uh, when Jesus got away, there were some times that uh, people would interrupt him. Sometimes uh, people would uh, uh, ask him for healing or something, to, something uh, uh, ministry-wise when he was trying to practice solitude. And notice that Jesus didn't, didn't say things like, well, get away from here, you're, you're bothering me, or, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm too, my personal time is too important for you right now. Um, he didn't go about it that way. Jesus kind of uh, uh, 
what we would call rolled with the flow uh, of that uh, this kind of ministry. So Jesus did practice the discipline of solitude or silence, waiting for God's word, listening for God's word. He got away by himself, yet he had this space open for what we would call the ministry of interruptions. Now, Bonhoeffer gets really specific in this chapter about how exactly to go about uh, the, the discipline of silence and solitude. Remember last week we talked about what does it mean to um, function well together in community, ministering together in community. And then the week before that, we talked about the, uh, uh, the difference between community and association. So this week we're going to talk about what happens when we are by ourselves. What happens when uh, nobody is around, uh, when we do have some downtime. Uh, when we intentionally create some space to read and to listen to God's word. What does that look like on a day-to-day -day basis? How do we do that? How do we wait for God's word and listen for God's word uh, when not just a whole lot of people are around and when we make some space to be alone with the Lord? Well, Bonhoeffer talks about three specific practices in detail uh, in this chapter. Uh, one is called biblical meditation. Biblical meditation. Now, you may hear the word meditation and uh, your mind goes back to like uh, things that, uh, you know, monks did in the 1960s or, you know, the hippies and that sort of thing. When we talk about meditation, that is, that is not what we're talking about here. Uh, we're not talking about uh, embracing some Eastern philosophy and trying to incorporate that into, uh, uh, into Christianity. In fact, that kind of meditation, uh, the, the, the Eastern mystical philosophical tradition, uh, that's more about satisfying our ego uh, and concentrating on the flesh than it is on uh, meditating upon the Word of God. So when we use the word meditation, and specifically when Bonhoeffer references it here, we're not talking about some mystical union with the universe and um, that, that sort of thing. We're not talking about pleasing our ego. We're talking about listening to the Word of God and meditating upon it, not upon what we want, but upon what God wants. And there's three steps to what we would call biblical meditation um, in this practice of solitude or silence that uh, Bonhoeffer talks about. The first step is to choose a biblical text. The second step is to consider the meaning of that text. And then the third step is to wait for the Holy Spirit to speak to us about that text. So let, let's kind of break that down a little bit. Choose a biblical text. So um, I, I often recommend to people that when they uh, get really serious about um, uh, getting into the scriptures, um, I often recommend that people start in the Gospel of Mark, uh, the Gospel of John, uh, the Gospel of Matthew, or the Psalms. Uh, if you start in those, those four uh, books, you can really begin to pick up on this discipline very, very well. And you can choose a text in, uh, in those specific books, if this is the first time you've uh, done this sort of thing, you choose a text and you read it and you just sit with that text. Make sure you, you free yourself from distractions, but you just sit with that text. Let's say you're reading John 1.1. Uh, 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So let's say you're con you choose that trip, you choose that text, and it may not make sense the first go around, so you begin to read it again, and you begin to uh, consider the meaning of that text. What does this really mean? And again, it's not just talking about what it means for me. We're talking about what does this mean, not only for me, but for, uh, but for the world. What is God trying to tell us here? And you may pray and say, Holy Spirit, help me to understand this. Open my eyes to this. It's confusing. I don't know what exactly you want me to understand here. And the Holy Spirit will do that. You choose a text. You consider the meaning of that text, and then 
You ask and listen for the Holy Spirit to illuminate that text for you. That is biblical meditation. You're waiting on the Word of God and receiving that Word. Now, you may, uh, in these times of, of concentrating on the Scripture, you may uh, think that uh, you hear from God, but it's something that uh, you're not really sure about. Maybe you're not really comfortable with. So let me give you a word of warning, and Bonhoeffer says this too. But what the Spirit tells you must, about that text, what the Spirit tells you about the text you, you've chosen, concentrated on, that whatever the Spirit is saying must be in line with the other scriptures. In other words, the Spirit is not inconsistent. Uh, sometimes I think we, we hear our own brains talking about the, the biblical text that may be saying things that are not whatsoever in line with God's will, God's word, and, uh, uh, and so that kind of, those kind of thoughts need to be discarded. But when you're right, reading the Bible, make sure that what you uh, think the Spirit is, is putting on your heart is not only contextual, it's, written, it's read in context of the passage that is written, but you're also going to find that whatever the Spirit has laid on your heart about that text is going to be consistent with the other scriptures. Also, there's a great uh, term that, um, that Bonhoeffer uses, a great statement about biblical meditation. He says, seek God, not happiness. <laughs> I love that. When it comes to reading the Bible, when it comes to concentrating on it, listening for the Spirit, a lot of people today do that because they want some sense of happiness. But we all know that happiness just lasts for a, a, a time. It, it, it's up, you're up one minute, you can be down the next. But with the Word of God, we're seeking, we're seeking not happiness, but we're seeking the peace and the joy that comes from receiving the Word of God and listening to it and communing with God. So again, meditation on the Word of God is not some mystical experience. It's not an Eastern philosophy. We're not seeking self-happiness. Um, or we're using that as some sort of coping mechanism. We're meditating, meditating on the Word of God in order to seek Him. So that's discipline number one. Discipline number two that Bonhoeffer talks about is prayer. How do you, when you get alone by yourself, how do you pray? Uh, what does that look like for you? Well, Bonhoeffer gives three uh, encouragements when it comes to prayer here. First of all, he uh, reminds us to free ourselves from distractions as best as we can. When we're praying, that is a really good time to turn the computer off, turn the phone off, turn the TV off. Whatever distracts you, um, that's a good, uh, a good thing to put away in times of prayer. Also, we're reminded, secondly, that prayer is not a competition. Uh, you are not out to, uh, to pray better than you know, uh, so-and-so that sits in the, in the chair next to you at church. So prayer is not a, a, a competition. This is something between you and God. And also, a good question. Number three, where is God leading you in prayer? You know, sometimes in prayer, God's going to put a thought on your heart. It's going to put a picture in your mind. Uh, God often does that to me. There's an image or uh, a person who randomly comes to mind, and it seems like uh, I've not thought about this person in 20 years. But God will bring that person to my thoughts while I am praying, and that's a pretty good indication to me I need to be praying for that person. Um, and so be, being sensitive to how the Holy Spirit works in your heart, your soul, and your spirit to commune with him and to pray as we ought. The third discipline uh, or the third practice of the discipline of solitude and silence is called intercession. Intercession, this is very close to prayer. In fact, uh, those two things intertwine very, very well. But what is intercession? Intercession specifically is interceding or praying on behalf, 
not of ourselves, but on behalf of someone, a brother or sister in the Lord. It's bringing someone into the presence of Christ so that we can appeal to that person's needs. Now, Jesus instructs us to intercede for specific people. One group that we may have trouble interceding for at times are our enemies or people who have done us wrong, either intentionally or unintentionally. Do we intercede for them? Because something happens when we begin to pray for and intercede for someone who has hurt us. Uh, first of all, it uh, helps us deal with grief and hurt that's happened in our own lives. Secondly, it, 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 it uh, is beneficial that we're praying for, not against, but praying for someone who has hurt us. And third, it helps us to develop an attitude of forgiveness. You know, forgiveness is more of an attitude than it is uh, an action, I've found. That forgiveness is something that I have to choose to do each and every day, especially when hurtful things happen or I remember something that uh, was done to me or a hurt in my life that, you know, dates back years and years and years ago. That still comes up and causes uh, consternation in the spirit. Well, God can help us as we pray and intercede even for our enemies. And also, we're uh, uh, instructed in the Word of God to intercede consistently for one another, for people in our church. Who are those who are experiencing heartache? Who are those who uh, are ill and need healing? Who are those people that God is putting on our hearts to intercede for on a consistent daily basis? All right, so to kind of wrap up things here, this week we're talking about the discipline of solitude and silence. Uh, what do we do when we get alone with God? And there are three specific practices talked about in this chapter that help us a great deal when it comes to the discipline of solitude. The practice of biblical meditation. Again, biblical, not some Eastern philosophy or hippie thing. This is, an, this is biblical meditation, seeking God and not happiness. Uh, number two, practice is the practice of prayer. And number three is the practice of intercession, both for our enemies and for uh, one another in the body of Christ. Well, that's going to do it for this Monday. I hope you have a great rest of your week, and we'll look forward to seeing you again on Sunday for Bible study and for worship. Have a great week, everybody. Bye-bye.